66-year-old Mr. Templeton is forever setting records. Tonight, he adds one more. He's making an unprecedented ninth appearance as my guest on this program. John, when you were here right after the crash and were correctly counseling patients and not panic, you said it was possible that the bear market was already over, was it? It looks more like it every day. We've just had a new high since the crash. Fourteen months after the crash, it would be hard to say that we have not already started a, bear, a bull market. So that although we don't know how long this bull market will last, I believe when economic history is written, we will say that was one of the most dramatic but also the shortest bear market which ended uh, 14 months ago. People asked that you earlier in this decade when you said on this program that you thought we'd get to 3,000 in this decade where we got within 300 points of it. Do you think we might still make it this year? <laughs> I, doubt, I, I doubt it's an even chance that we will get there by the end of 89. But I would think it's still an even chance we will reach 3,000 by the end of 1990. And if, as you just suggested, we are embarking on a great new bull market, how high do you think it will go in the 90s? Higher than almost anyone expects. By the time the next bull market gets roaring, earnings should be 40% higher than now. That would justify share prices 40% higher than the previous peak. That would be over 4,000 on the Dow. The last bull market carried share prices to triple where they had been. Triple the low point for this one would carry them to 5,100. Also, it, the shortage of shares that has developed in this time might carry them higher than that. So I would uh, say that by the time that this bull market reaches its peak, there's a 50-50 chance that I will be above 5,000. I can hardly wait. Right. John, uh, you, your funds have had a good year, in part because of an accident. You picked stocks on the basis of value, and then some of these takeover boys came in and took over a lot of your companies. Some people are worried that the takeover craze has gone too far. Do you share that concern? Yes, we do. Uh, we've always wanted to buy those things that have the lowest price in relation to what the corporations really were. And, of course, the acquisition people are looking for the same thing. The fact that the acquisition people are paying 50% of higher premiums above market price proves that American shares are still selling for less than they're worth. The fact that 700 corporations are buying in their own stock proves they're selling for less than they're worth. The fact that the bear market didn't go any longer than it did indicates that shares are still on the bargain counter. But there have been so many of these acquisitions that the prices now are getting above true value. People are paying more than they should. But the worst thing is that these huge acquisitions result in a great decrease in government tax revenue because they substitute for the common stock debt on which the interest is deductible. And I think that should be corrected, and probably before this year is out, we will see some change in the tax law so that mergers will still be permitted, acquisitions will still be permitted, but not subsidized by the Treasury Department. Where are you finding legitimate bargains now? All over. We're finding enormous numbers of bargains in America. We have over 65% of our investments in America. That's we unusually high for you, isn't it? It is, yes. Uh, only once before did we ever have 50, over 50% 50 in one nation, and that was 25 years ago, 20 years ago, in Japan. But now with 65% in America, that's the highest we've ever been in any single nation. We're also finding bargains in New Zealand, uh, Hong Kong, Canada, and England. Where in the U.S. are you finding bargains? In those things that are depressed. It, you don't get a bargain when, except when other people are selling. The prices only go down when other people are pushing them down by selling. So you have to buy those things that are unpopular. One of the areas that's unpopular now are the financial stock, all the, the financial stock, particularly the companies that sponsor mutual funds are selling at remarkably low prices. Another area is life insurance such as uh, Cigna Insurance, is selling at a remarkably low price. The bank stocks are selling at low prices now. National Bank of Canada is a very great bargain. So is Westpac Banking. Uh, also, emerging growth stocks are very unpopular. I have been since uh, July 1983. They are on the bargain counter now. Stocks like Standard Pacific, which has a marvelous management and growth record, is selling only six times earnings with a cash yield of 12%. I've got three kids and I want to talk to you. Sorry, Ricardo Mandel. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lou.
Uh, John, um, uh, as you've said, you're a worldwide investor uh, and you transfer money from country to country. Do you perceive a major nation emerging uh, in the next uh, century, perhaps, the way the United States did in the last century, uh, both economically and socially and so on? Very much so, Carter. Mm-hmm. After the First World War, America blossomed out as the world leader in the economy. And after the Second World War, that happened to Japan. Mm-hmm. When we began to invest in Japan, the total market in Japan was smaller than the capitalization of international business issues. Now the Japanese market is so big, 40% larger than the American market. In fact, the Japanese market is now larger than all the world's markets ever were until as recently as five years ago. It's been an extraordinary story. But that shows the world is speeding up. We're going to get faster and faster progress. And if you had to pick one nation that is going to be well worth watching in the next 25 years, it's mainland China. Mm. I've just come from there investigating opportunities, and that huge population of a billion people is doubling their standard of living every seven years. That's going to have a huge effect on the world. And when Hong Kong becomes part of mainland China, those business people in Hong Kong will speed up the progress of mainland China. It's a wonderful thing. We worked for centuries to have every nation become prosperous. Now the poor nations are becoming prosperous, and we should all rejoice and be glad. John, as all these other markets have become much more important, the U.S. stock market, which used to be the biggest game in town, I think is now less than a third of the global equity market. What does this mean for the future of the U.S. as an economic power? Oh, it's wonderful, Mary. America is, is rapidly growing growing more rapidly than ever. Just in the last two years, we've added five million new jobs in America. No major nation ever added five million jobs in two years. In the last 20 years, America has added 20 million new jobs, and that process is speeding up. The standard of living in America is likely to quadruple in only the next 40 years. That never happened in a major nation before. But compared to the rest of the world, others will be growing even faster, which we rejoice in. Many of the poor nations are growing more rapidly than America and probably will continue to. And what a happy situation to have everyone more prosperous. It means America will be more prosperous if your neighbors are more prosperous. Uh, John, do you have any particular outlook on inflation? And given your outlook, uh, what companies might benefit by it? Um, Marty, inflation is a problem. It's a problem because of human nature. All over the world, people spend too much. And they, they borrow too much. And... Nations borrow too much, and the net result in all history is going to be more inflation. It'll go in cycles, however. There'll be some good years when we may have as little as 1 or 2 percent inflation. On other years, it may get above 15 percent, as it did once in America. Over the long period, it'll probably average out to doubling the cost of living about every 10 years. And that's the reason why you shouldn't hold too much in cash, because cash is sure to lose its purchasing power. Instead of that, you should hold things that are likely to reflect the higher prices. So if you own a grocery store, the same quantity of groceries costs twice as much, you'll have twice as much profit. So the thing to buy for inflation are those stocks that are most depressed in price and have the ba- greatest potential, therefore, to benefit from higher cur- trading volume. So I'm nearly out of time. Why do you think pessimism is so popular? Human nature... People don't buy newspapers that announce the good news, that some catastrophe attracts the public. And, and because communication is so much more instantaneous than ever, we are flooded with pessimistic things from nations that we never would have heard of before. It's always a tonic to have your antidote, then. Thanks very much, John Templeton. Thanks to our panelists. Hope you will be back with us again next week. Then we'll check in on an industry that has...